So I want to welcome you to the Energy Seminar. Today we have Mark Williamson and Robert Trezona from the UK's Carbon Trust. The Carbon Trust is a private company set up by the UK government to combat the threat of climate change. Robert is the head of research and development and responsible for the Carbon Trust investment in low carbon R&D. Uh, Mark is the director of innovations and um, so both Robert and Mark have PhDs. Robert has a PhD in material science and Mark has a PhD in wireless communications. So they're here today to talk about um, assessment frameworks, methods of intervention, and future plans for carbon trust innovations. First of all, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Alice. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think when uh, we decided to come and visit California at this time, uh, we'd already made some contacts with Google in London and thought this would be a great place to be to talk about um, innovation, uh, low carbon technologies, and indeed the work you're doing in RE less than C. Um, as Anna said, I, I'm, I'm the head of uh, research and development. I'm joined by Mark Williamson, who is the director of innovations, who looks after all of our uh, technology work, R&D, demonstration, and business incubation. So let me tell you a bit about the Carbon Trust and what we do. Um, Carbon Trust is a um, private company that is funded at the moment by the UK government. So almost all of the money that we have and the investments that we make, grants we give and so on, comes from the UK taxpayer. Uh, we have a turnover of about 100 million pounds and a staff of 150. However, we can make profit. We're allowed to make earnings from some of the activities that we do, but they're reinvested in, into our activities. They're not distributed to shareholders. Um, and while we're independent, what we're actually accountable to for the UK government is tons of carbon saved per pound invested. So we're an independent entity. We're essentially a company that tries to maximize that number, unlike a, a normal company which tries to maximize profitability. And that's all pulled together by this mission. So the Carbon Trust is a company that really has a mission that drives everything we do. It's pretty simple to accelerate the move to a low carbon economy, but it's pretty profound. And, and you know, the words in there that really mean something to us are accelerate. We're all about making things happen faster than they would do if the private sector alone were operating. Low carbon is, 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 is fairly you know, obvious, and, and that means various things. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But economy is actually pretty important. We're at, and what we're talking about is, is using public funds, taxpayers' money to generate a sustainable low carbon economy. So for us, a low carbon economy is a sustainable, um, a commercially viable uh, version of the UK or any other economy that does not rely on subsidy. So in the title of the talk, we're talking about market failures and interventions. What we're trying to do with, with, with this um, public money that we're, with, with which we're entrusted is to use the minimum possible intervention to try and make that low carbon economy happen more quickly. We've, got a, we've been operating now for about seven years, um, and we have this pretty strong mandate. Um, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair gave us this sort of um, you know, instruction, if you like, to take the lead, not just in helping businesses with saving carbon today, but also in developing um, new low carbon technologies. And there are four areas of the Carbon Trust that sort of act on that mission. The first is the area that Mark and I work in, and Mark heads up that division, that's innovations. And that's specifically focused on new low carbon technologies. But that's augmented by three other areas. So investments is a VC arm. It's a, it's a commercial venture capital company that makes investments in low carbon companies on commercial terms. Enterprises is a corporate venturing arm. Again, it's a commercial arm of the Carbon Trust. It uses seed capital from our public funds, but it tries to create self-sustaining, fully commercial businesses. Loans and Salix are two, are two interventions where we provide interest-free loans to, in the case of loans, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, and Salix to the public sector to try and deploy um, carbon-saving uh, capital equipment that wouldn't otherwise, uh, wouldn't otherwise happen. So there's actually quite a range of different things we do that all act on low-carbon technologies. They're all driven by that mission about the low-carbon economy. So when we think about um, what needs to happen and what sort of transition technologies, products, low carbon services need to go through to make that, ha make that a reality, 
there are sort of four journeys. We use this pretty simple framework to think about everything we do in low carbon technology. You're probably familiar with this concept of take, going from basic research through demonstration, through early adopters, and finally to having a fully warranted product that generates, um, you know, that, that's, that is regarded by customers as having high quality. The other three journeys are less commonly talked about, but in, in our sort of experience, they're essential as something you need to think through quite carefully if you're trying to get new low carbon technology to market. So all for us, any low carbon technology is, is sold or marketed by private company. We're all about trying to get private companies to do that. And the company itself, as well as the technology, has to go through transition to make that happen. We've worked with a lot of small startup spin-out companies, but also even within a large company. Quite frequently, it's a new business unit or a new venture within a large company that drives through a disruptive new technology. So that's important. It's also important to think about the market. And again, this sounds obvious, but we work, you know, we've worked with thousands of people who have great concepts for technology, but their understanding of really where the markets are going to be is not as sophisticated as it needs to be. And quite often, they don't have the resources to necessarily get that data, and that's a key area where we help. We, we, we run field trials to help an entire sector understand their market better and, and thereby overcome key barriers in that. And finally, the regulation journey is um, very relevant for low carbon because most of the technologies or products that we are looking at operate in regulated markets. And what we've seen is generally the regulation that exists has been formulated in total ignorance of this new concept, this new product that might be coming through. And quite often, it's unintentionally negative and it's impeding that product. So we do a lot of work where we look at um, how we can influence regulation, and we have a track record of making that happen. So this is another way of looking at the structure of the Carbon Trust. And as you can see, we've got a pretty good coverage across those four journeys. So Mark and I, as I said, work in innovations. This R&D, that's my area. We, we help businesses as an incubation services, which helps businesses with good low carbon technology think about how they're going to commercialize that. Technology acceleration is all about market barriers. So these are typically field trials, but they're normally designed with a specific market problem or market issue in mind. And they're normally done with a range of different companies that have that technology. So it's about convening groups of, groups of entities together to face a, a common problem. As I said, we have this VC arm, and these overlap. So we help the uh, venture capital team understand the technical issues. They frequently work with the people that we're incubating. And quite often, there's, a, there's an overlap, particularly in, say, marine energy, between some of the investments we've made and companies across a whole sector that we've helped. Enterprises is normally further down the chain. And a way I describe this is um, we do it where we see there's a technology that exists. It's, it's viable. But no one has, in, in the UK this, at this time, created a business. So it's a market failure of entrepreneurship. And the best way to demonstrate that, 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 that you can make money in that is to actually create a business and do it. So we're doing that, for instance, at the moment with anaerobic digestion. There's been an almost sort of um, disappointing take up of that technology in the UK. It can save carbon. The technology is proven. It hasn't really happened. So we've just created a company that does that. And it's now raising significant private finance. And you know, when that's successful, we will step out and let other companies come into that market. And as I said, loans and Salix are all about um, taking you know, warranted products and helping um, small businesses or the public sector in the UK uh, adopt them by providing finance. And all of it's underpinned by the policy insights department who, are, uh, who develop uh, policy papers both for government and for um, business leaders to think about different aspects of the low carbon economy and how technology might impact on that. So um, what does that actually look like? A uh, bit more detail around the research and development area that I look after. We have this thing called the open call, which is a, um, a reactive competition that we run three times a year for the best low carbon sort of concepts, technology concepts. And people who win sort of a grant from us on that, they, they get up to half a million pounds worth of funding for a specific low carbon um, technology project. And, and one of the reasons that we do this, um, because it's quite similar to some of the other bodies in the UK who, fund, who are active in this area, they provide grants as well. For us, it helps us really understand what the cutting edge is in low carbon technology. We've seen some really disruptive concepts that we hadn't seen coming from a top down perspective come into us through this, through this mechanism. And currently, we've, sort of, uh, we've seen well over 2,000 applications here, and we've backed about 166. So well under 
actually get through, and we've made it very clear that we're looking for the leading innovators in the UK for that scheme. That then helps us design some of these other things. And there are a couple of big projects in R&D at the moment where we've directed research. We've, we've, we've taken a, um, a, a look at uh, a low-carbon technology landscape uh, and looked for sort of key opportunities where you, you sort of say, if you had the following IP or capabilities in 10 years' time, that could be a really interesting business and it could save a lot of carbon. Generally, when we do directed research, these two areas here, the IP doesn't yet exist. So we, again, we run a competition to say, here are the parameters around what could be a really successful low carbon business. If you can do the following things, come to us with a proposal for that and we will provide funding to start you on that journey and then help you raise further, further finance. So actually constructing um, new low carbon technologies and companies that will deliver those technologies from scratch using the knowledge that we've got from, from this scheme and other areas of, of, of our activities. So there are a couple of um, big projects underway at the moment. One is in advanced photovoltaics. We've been working with the winner of that, of that project was the University of Cambridge and a company called the Technology Partnership. And they're looking at ultra low cost um, organic photovoltaics. Advanced bioenergy is a more recent innovation and we, we've started looking at um, concepts that would be genuinely, in terms of biofuels, save carbon genuinely sustainable, not competing with food, not competing with water resources. And also do things like um, use existing infrastructure and use existing supply chains as much as possible. Because when we think about carbon as a picture, the embodied carbon in today's vehicles, in today's fuel distribution structures and refineries is enormous. And that the more you can do that will actually allow um, re renewable transport fuels to use that infrastructure, the better. So that actually um, gave us a couple of ideas, one of which is around uh, bio-crude or pyrolysis oil upgrading, where we're taking um, distributed biomass using pyrolysis and existing technology to make a liquid out of that. And the innovation, the challenge, is to take that which is not currently suitable for putting into a refinery, putting into a vehicle, and upgrading it. So we have to reduce acidity, take oxygen out. So it's significantly challenging, but very interesting from both a carbon perspective and an economic perspective, if it could happen. And the other thing which we launched last week is a, a project in algae. So actually growing, here's some algae here, um, growing algae as the original source of biomass. And uh, why is that exciting? Because um, they have demonstrated, people have demonstrated that you can grow many more tons of biomass per hectare using algae than you can with terrestrial crops. Um, it also allows you not to have to use fresh water, which we think is, is deeply important. But there's a massive issue with the cost of doing that. So we think it's worth looking at, and we're funding some early stage R&D to start with, to try and address that problem. And finally, we also support research at research institutions. That's almost basic research. It's one of the fundamental problems around low carbon technology. And we do a number of ways to do it with grants. We also um, ran a, com a competition for carbon leaders. So we, we support a couple of key academics in the UK who won this competition. Um, and are doing sort of fundamental research in low carbon technologies. This is um, the th kind of the first half of technology acceleration, which is the uh, further down those four journeys, looking at issues around whole markets and problems that um, technology is run into there. Um, the first of those is around industrial energy efficiency. So we, we, we did about a six month study looking at how efficiently, particularly sort of medium-sized uh, industrial operations are actually being run and whether there were um, opportunities to help companies save, for their, from their, their perspective, money and energy from our perspective, carbon. And the conclusion was that absolutely is the case, but um, there's no silver bullet, there's no one key technology. You actually need to work with them in quite an in intimate way. So we're actually piloting this concept with a number of sort of um, areas at the moment animal feed, plastic bottle, and asphalt manufacturing. Not particularly sexy areas, but all the areas that we've identified are real carbon saving. Micro CHP, so micro combined heat and power, um, is this concept of having um, small power generating units in your home or business um, that can make both electrical power and heat. Um, and one of the issues with this technology, which is relatively well proven, is people didn't really know which would be the markets where it would save money and carbon. And some of the, we've been running this now for three years, some of the conclusions that come out of it are relatively counterintuitive. So because of the way people heat their homes in the UK, this doesn't have particularly good application to a lot of domestic situations. 
It's a very different story to the commercial. So small commercial uh, premises uh, in our trial have saved significant amount of money and carbon on this. And that's a sort of market insight that the companies that we're working with here couldn't have accessed. They couldn't have been smarter. The issue was they, they weren't able to fund a field trial like this. So in doing this, and we published results of that, we've actually really helped the industry understand where they need to target their product development and marketing. In the Low Carbon Buildings Accelerator, we're working with understanding the challenges of refurbishment. So there's a lot of work going on internationally around how to make new buildings that um, uh, are lower carbon. That's, that's great, but certainly in the UK, it's been like 70% of the buildings that will be in place in 2050 already exist. There's a massive challenge about how do you make build, how do you refurbish buildings to um, reduce their carbon footprint. We've just started a project in ultra-efficient lighting. So again, this is one, this is a technology that sort of exists, but it's not being deployed um, very widely, certainly not in the UK. And we're trying to use this concept of forward equipment and procurement to, to stimulate a market. So we'll use public sector institutions who have enormous budgets and enormous um, volumes of procurement to help stimulate that market. In energy supply in technology acceleration, we've got um, sort of three large projects and one slightly smaller one. And the first of those is in, in offshore wind. Now, the UK is now committed by law as part of the European Union um, sort of uh, mandate to supply 15% of its electricity from renewables by 2020. Now, we're actually currently at 2%. So the UK has a reasonably low carbon footprint because we use natural gas for a lot of our, um, and we have some nuclear for a lot of our electrical power, but there's hardly any renewable generation in the UK. Some of the analysis that we've done is, is in order to meet that 2020 target, really the only way the UK is going to do that is via offshore wind. We have some on onshore wind, deployment of that's going to continue, but fairly obvious land constraint reasons, it's not going to be sufficient. So we think this is very important, and we've kind of attacked attack this in two ways. We are doing a big project with five European um, energy companies to look at cost reduction and trying to improve the project returns for these offshore wind farms. And we've also done a big policy piece to, to look at the key policy levers that would need to change for the costs of these farms to come down significantly. In marine energy, um, we've actually been working on that for about five years. And the UK has a great, as well as offshore wind resource, has a great marine energy resource, so tidal stream and wave in particular. And um, we've done a number of things there. We've actually worked with marine developers to develop a proper cost of energy model. One of the real issues in the sector was um, people didn't really know what the costs were. People knew they were going to be high, but there wasn't a lot of detail behind that. And I'll talk more about it in a minute. But we've worked with that. And this, second, uh, this is now our second project we're doing with the marine sector, is really looking at how we then attack those, those, those cost barriers. Biomass heating, again, not a particularly sexy technology, but in terms of renewable heat, so we talk a lot about renewable um, electricity. If you want renewable heat, then there aren't that many alternative options, and we need to see a lot more deployment of um, sort of forested residue and other forms of renewable biomass into heating in the UK. And finally, this is a slightly different project, small-scale wind energy. Um, I don't know how much you've seen this in the US, but there's been a lot of people buying these sort of small wind turbines, slamming them onto the side of the house and thinking that's actually saving carbon. Um, we went and did a very fact-based um, study on um, what these actually do with the UK um, uh, Meteorological Office. And they literally did a whole lot of pretty complicated modeling for these sort of scenarios. And I've also developed a tool which we're going to put online for people to calculate, you know, if that's my home and I live in a certain part of the UK and this, this uh, pole is a certain height, how much energy am I going to generate? And it shows you that almost in 90% of urban locations, that wind turbine will not repay its carbon. So there's more, there'll be more carbon got into making it than we'll ever sort of get back in, in, in generating electricity. And that's, while that's a slightly negative result, it's pretty important because what, what we did find is in, in rural locations, they can be really uh, significant. And we, we, we've been working with the manufacturers of, of those um, turbines to help them you know, reposition maybe some of their, um, some of their products. Some of the new things we're looking at, uh, sorry, I should mention business incubation. It's a slightly different type of intervention. It's much lower cost. And we work with companies to help them understand how to turn a low carbon technology into an investable proposition. So it's business plan development. It's uh, thinking about revenue, cost modeling, and investor readiness. 
And finally, there's a couple of things in the pipeline. We're looking at, um, at some interesting ideas around novel materials for low-cost fuel cells. Um, and thinking about taking some of the knowledge from the previous building work and the, and the work we do directly with about 50,000 UK companies at the moment and packaging that up into a commercial buildings offering. So I'll spin through the investment enterprise and loans in a, bit, 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 a bit more quickly because that's, that's not Mark and my area. But the investments, as I said, it, it, it's, a, it's a VC play constrained to clean tech that can use our brand and to some extent use the expertise in the rest of the carbon trust to help them understand. So the way they're distinctive is they're able to leverage that expertise and invest earlier than a lot of the other, certainly in the, in the UK, the other VCs are prepared to do. So they made a number of, I think it's eight, nine or ten investments to date. It's not a particularly large fund, but what it's really there to do is to show others that it is profitable to get involved in clean tech early on. And they've had a really great um, track record with doing that. So recent investments include Four Energy, which is an energy efficiency company. Again, not, not a trillion dollar market, but um, perfectly, a perfectly healthy company. Uh, and they're showing that, I mean, this, this thing works in um, mobile telecoms base stations. 90% reduction in energy usage is you know, a number that got people pretty excited. I'll pick out Green Biologics. They're, another, um, they're a biofuel company that have developed a novel way to make butanol a better fuel than, than ethanol. So these guys have been doing that for about six years, and they're certainly the, probably the first uh, clean tech VC investor in the UK. Enterprises is um, this corporate venturing arm of the Carbon Trust, and a couple of examples here um, relevant to sort of uh, technology. Partnerships for Renewables is a business which um, opens up public sector lands, a land owned by schools, hospitals, other parts of the public sector for development of renewables. That's about 10% of the land in the UK, and we've noticed that almost none of the deployments of renewables at the moment, it's mainly wind, was happening there. So we set up a company that leverages our connections with the public sector to open up that land uh, for development. And that's raised, um, it's aiming to deliver 500 megawatts uh, on public land. It's raised 100 million pounds in finance already. So that's, it's, it's attracting pretty significant uh, interest from the, from the private sector. Connective Energy, again, it's, it's another a company which uses existing technology um, to solve a low carbon problem. In this case, it's about um, project development that allows um, sort of operations that are sort of near each other to, to w where there's excess heat in one location and a heat demand in another location to actually do a transaction and, and share heat around. In-source energy is an, is an energy to waste business, currently focused mainly, as I said um, on the previous slide, on anaerobic digestion, but the concept is a project development company. So they come in and offer us kind of a turnkey project, currently working with um, waste food in the UK, and that there are several megatons of that every year to make uh, power and heat. Finally, loans and salix, as I said, it's, it's this concept of taking um, some public sector capital and offering interest-free loans. And what we found through working with, well, as I said, 50,000 companies in the UK and a large number of pro public sector organizations is even where there's a rational economic um, sort of decision, you know, a piece of low-carbon technology is going to save the, the company or um, the public institution money. Quite often, the people who want to develop that project cannot raise the capital internally. There are you know, various constraints, both political and procedural. So providing an, an interest-free loan, um, which is a relatively low-cost intervention for us, can make all the difference. And you know, we've made 722 loans. Um, you know, a significant amount of capital has been deployed, but it's also leveraging a lot, a lot of private funds. I mentioned earlier the, the policy arm called Insights of the Carbon Trust. And, and this has published something like 40 different pretty well-researched publications in, in various areas of technologies. A couple of recent ones are the Low Carbon Technology Commercialization Review, which is trying to ask the question, you know, there are various things in the UK that are trying to support our moves to um, go to a low carbon economy. And the question was, how well suited is, is, is that structure? What changes might need to be happened? And um, that has been a nine-month study. So it's pretty deep, and it's looking at innovation models all over the world. It's looking at um, you know, generic and specific market failures in low-carbon technologies. And finally, I should mention the um, offshore wind. So I talked earlier about um, the offshore wind technology work. Well, we accompanied that 
with this um, strategic plan around policy development. And one of the key conclusions from the study was that there are some specific bits of regulation that have, massive, have a massive influence on um, how likely the UK is actually going to be, be to, the, to the deploy maybe uh, 35 gigawatts of wind that we need to uh, in the next sort of 12 years. I'll just sort of spin through a couple of case studies. Um, I mentioned marine energy. Uh, this is something that w the UK has quite a strong heritage in, and there was a lot of work done in the 70s and 80s um, about marine. But um, when a lot of the uh, energy utilities were privatized in the 80s, a lot of that R&D was cut, and the, kind of, the thing kind of sat there in stasis, uh, with no real progress being made. And one of the issues were that um, not a lot of investment going in. There wasn't a particular uh, policy incentive. Cost of energies was both regarded as being uncompetitively high, but also not very well understood. So we sat there, we designed a bespoke intervention to try and you know, demonstrate a potential for cost reduction. So not just say, we think that the costs are actually this at the moment. Try to actually design a trajectory for how the cost might change over time. We also wanted to um, try and change the policy framework to try and get investment into the sector. So we ran something called the Marine Energy Challenge in 2004. And this was something that had never been done in the UK before. Rather than say, here are some grants, or working maybe with our VC team to look at investments they can make in companies, we said, we, we're going to run a public competition to anyone who has a compelling concept for a marine energy device. And the prize at the end of that competition is not just some funding. The prize is a pretty large amount of um, detailed engineering consultancy to work on your device. So we awarded the, um, those contracts to eight sort of people with, with concepts, most of, which, most of them coming from the UK academic sector. Um, and we got the consultants that, that we'd, we'd procured to work directly with them on their, on their, on their sort of device concept. And that was of benefit to the individual teams um, involved. But what it led us to do is understand very sort of fundamentally what the issues were around various different device morphologies. Um, we then published that and said, well, this is what we've got in the UK. These, these, these are what we think the best device concepts. Here's what the, the cost of energy might be for them. And here's what we might want to do next. And that led to suddenly the whole marine industry or the marine sector became a lot more sort of energized. So we had the non people applying for those applied research grants. We had people working with us in business incubation. And there was this concept of the European Marine Energy Center, which has been set up in Scotland, um, which has provided for the first time a sort of testing bay. Um, because a big issue with some of these small companies is, is they develop their concept, they model it, they put it in a wave tank, they build one, and then the actual infrastructure even to test it to show it actually can produce power competitively costs millions. So the, the European Marine Energy Center um, is a sort of industry-wide facility that allows these companies to do that. So, I mean, what are the sort of conclusions from that study? Well, one thing is, is this is pretty surprising. That's 15 to 20 percent of UK annual electricity demand could be met by these resources. That was simply unknown before we did the study. And that, again, it changed both the way the industry and, and uh, the government thought about this sector. We've estimated the worldwide resource as well. For us, um, we've got a significant carbon saving that we know much more precisely than we did before. And we looked at the worldwide resource. There's this big economic value story. And we've also pinpointed some specific things about the UK that made it sort of worth us going, going further forward with it. So the UK has got these large indigenous energy resources. We've got some of those people who are working in the 70s and 80s in marine are still around. They're incredibly experienced uh, and are generally involved in a lot of these uh, projects. And finally, we've got, um, well, we're an island. We, we understand a fair amount about offshore engineering, some of the spe uh, specific challenges you have in maritime uh, environments. So there are a couple of recommendations that came out. Um, some of those adopted by the UK government, Scottish government, and we actually then launched another initiative. So the whole concept is, having done something, seen the results, and we're able to um, deploy further resources where we, think that's, where we think that's appropriate. And the objective of the second initiative, the Marine Energy Accelerator, is really to um, take this curve, which is the one that we developed from uh, that first project, 
and look at sort of uh, interventions that can make a discontinu discontinuity in, in that trajectory down towards what a target cost might be for marine energy. So we're focusing explicitly on cost reduction. We're building on that knowledge base I mentioned earlier. And we're using about three and a half million pounds of funding to try and stimulate those activities. There are three kind of parts of that. The first is um, new lower, sort of lower energy um, device concepts, or sorry, lower cost device concepts. But these are sort of new, this concept of there's actually a whole lot of components in any of these energy devices, like hydraulics, like electronics, and so on, that need to be much lower cost for these sort of deployments. And the second strand of this um, energy accelerator focuses on that. Um, and finally, a big, a big component of when you deploy a farm of these things, as opposed to just one device, you have to have to think quite, quite carefully about um, the actual operation and maintenance costs. So we can be more, much more precise now about, about what this cost down curve looks like. And, and this, is, this is the one uh, for WAVE. Current, current cost of deployment, if you took the best WAVE technology in the UK at the moment, you'd be at about 25 uh, UK pence per kilowatt hour in terms of cost of, of energy. That's uncompetitively high. Grid is about five. Learning effects and scale get you to sort of there um, where you've deployed sort of 100 gigawatts, which isn't going to happen. There isn't enough resource. So we needed to change this curve, and these sort of three strands that I mentioned on the left here are all projected to have sort of parts of, of, of that, that story and, and, and be parts of that change. So I'll just do, I'll just do one more. I think we're sort of slightly, slightly um, short on time, and I'm sure you might have some questions for us. I'm talking about sort of photovoltaics, which I think is something that um, is, is very important in California. And, and we've looked at um, the deployment of this. We spent a few, quite a few months looking at some of the issues around why there hadn't been a wider pickup in PV. And it comes quite fundamentally down to cost. There was a sort of trajectory from, from satellites to uh, rural, rural electrification. But what we've also seen is a lot of uh, certain countries, like Germany in particular, deciding to subsidize um, technology to try and deploy it. And we're not sure that's necessarily the right approach, because there's a risk of technology lock-in where you've got something like silicon PV that may be inherently too expensive. So we're more interested, particularly in innovations and new technologies, and looking at approaches that can, can change that game and, and, again, as I said, make a step change to that trajectory. Um, so you're either looking at very high efficiency cells or very low cost um, solutions. There's a fundamental issue around um, you know, getting cost out of silicon. People are looking at thin films and other ways of doing that, but it, it remains a big, a big challenge. Um, and so people are starting to look at sort of some of the other ways of doing that. So you can either look at solar concentrators, and there's a lot of work going on in California in that area, or in some of the areas we're looking at in the UK uh, with the Carbon Trust are looking at organic photovoltaics, actually using plastics as an ultra-low cost um, way of creating photovoltaic energy. We're doing some work on PV concentrators. Whitfield Solar is a company that... Um, applied to our venture capital arm. So this is one of the reactive things. These guys came to us. We have some expertise in, 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 uh, in solar to help understand how competitive that technology is. And we, um, we, we, made a, we were part of a one million pounds sort of you know, Series A um, investment in February. So that's quite interesting. The area that I'm looking after in, in R&D is around this maybe slightly longer term concept around uh, polymer photovoltaics. So we ran one of those. Um, research acceleration or directed research um, interventions to try and find a team who could deliver something like that and, and, and develop um, distinctive IP in, in the field of organic uh, uh, PV. And um, the winners of that were the University of Cambridge and a company called the Technology uh, Partnership. And Cambridge in particular have an incredibly strong history in um, polymer electronics. They've created a number of quite successful companies that, that use polymer electronics for display technology, for instance. And they're leveraging that understanding to work with us on developing an organic PV uh, solution. So we've taken a leading academic group. We're working with a major industrial manufacturer, of TTP. Um, and we're trying, actually going to try and create a startup company. So we've invested kind of in a, sort of five million pounds of this in the first stage of that is, is a research grant with the University of Cambridge. If that is successful, we will then incorporate a company that will try and drive that technology forward. 
as well as looking at uh, a new material concept, what that company is going to be doing is looking at reel-to-reel -reel printing as well to drive down the cost further. And the ultimate goal of that is to try and get power generation below 10 cents per kilowatt hour or even better than that. But that's certainly the sort of the threshold they're looking at as a starting point. So I have a couple more um, case studies here, but I'd like to sort of, I think we probably got th through the first 40 minutes. So are there any questions or any particular areas that people would like me to focus on? The solar, concentrating solar area, um, are you looking solely at PV or are you also looking at thermal or hot water? We, we haven't um, had any sort of compelling either um, research grant applications or company, uh, companies apply to us in that. So we're not currently looking at, at hot water. Um, you mentioned your bio, biofuels. Uh, are, are you thinking a uh, large scale about your process heat needs for industry? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, one thing we're trying to do, let me just sort of go through this. Um, we're looking at, one of the areas we're looking at is pyrolysis uh, and, and upgrading um, that oil into something that could go into a refinery. And part of the reason that's quite interesting is, is this concept of integrating it with refinery operations. And if you do that properly, then you have the ability to, to sort of use heat in a pretty sophisticated way. Um, and this, this um, again, we, we ran a public competition to um, select teams to work with us on this. We've had significant oil and gas major interests, and they're involved in some of the projects we're likely to take forward. So we're hoping to get access to that, that sort of refining engineering expertise um, and process um, engineering expertise to sort of take advantage of, of, of heat sort of opportunities. So I don't, I don't notice methane up there as a, as a biofuel. Is there a reason for that? Methane? Mm -hmm. Oh, these are liquid. We, we, yeah. No, we, we, we do like methane. Uh, no, this is that liquid, liquid biofuels. I was also curious on your organic uh, PVs. Uh, yeah. What do you look at as the difference in embodied carbon between those and, and some of the silicon technologies? Are they, uh, I, they look like they'd be hugely better, but yeah. I don't have any idea for what value to put on huge. They're significantly better. We haven't run the numbers yet because we haven't, we haven't, we haven't got the material set that we're going to use yet. So that's one of the reasons why it's starting out as a research project because they're actually running through a number of different material sets. But yeah, within that, they're quite a lot better than, than silicon in terms of embodied carbon. Trade-off is that lifetime for organics is going to be an issue. So yeah, you're looking at, at that trade-off as well. Um, could you describe uh, your investment in algae? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see if I have it on here. Let me just come out and go to... Uh, So these are the, these are the two um, biofuels areas. I've mentioned pyrolysis. Algae is, um, let's start looking at this at about a year ago. And it, it seemed quite exciting. As I said earlier, you've got this um, potential to grow many more sort of tons of, of, of biomass per hectare than you can with terrestrial crops. And, and we think the kind of the elephant in the room, unstated additional potential is this ability not to have to use wet, uh, fresh water. And that, that's pretty important. So that got us quite excited about it. Then we started talking to people. Uh, we've spoken to US, European, Israeli, Japanese experts, and, and attended a lot, of, a lot of conferences. And you run into a number of fairly fundamental issues with doing that, which is it's actually a Photoshop uh, image of what it would look like to deploy algae at scale. And that is the cost. Compared to having a bit of earth and planting terrestrial crops on it, that's a significant capital investment so your, the productivity of, of the algae that you get from that really has to be a lot higher than um, what you get from terrestrial crops. And you also need to be able to take this biomass, which is full of water, and dewater it and get, and get the oil or, or the carbohydrate out in a very low-cost way. None of those things are ready yet. So what we've said is 
we think there's a potential here, but what's been quite frustrating is there are very few hard facts available. Um, we certainly need to understand it better, and we think there are some fundamental issues that need looking at. So this, this, isn't, this, this sort of investment is going to be in two phases. The first phase will we, we'll sponsor relatively small projects looking at some sort of, sort of fundamental issues around this challenge of mass cultivation. So one of the issues is photosynthetic efficiency. How high can you go in, in an open pond? People have done, say, 5% in the lab. What is actually going to happen in, in an open pond, and how do you make that in a sustained way? There's another thing around algae, which is that you can make algae that have a very high oil content, but they tend not to be growing very quickly when they have a high oil content. Can you get both? Why not? What are the fundamental scientific limitations there? There's also a real issue with keeping these cultures at scale stable stable in terms of nutrient balance as pH, but also stable in terms of resistance to biological stress, so things that will eat them, fungi, viruses, and so on and so forth. And that, again, it's not a particularly sexy area, but it hasn't had enough understanding for someone to be able to say, oh, we're going to deploy 100 hectares of these ponds, because they would you'd have a significant risk that you couldn't keep that stable and the culture would die. So that's what, what we think needs to happen in terms of algae uh, pond cultivation. And we think a lot of the sort of uh, investment that's gone in recently has been maybe somewhat inappropriate because people, they've generally been predicated on someone with a, an algae grown in a lab making huge productivity, undoubtedly in a lab condition, of something that might be genetically modified or a very specific strain that doesn't really have relevance to the sort of deployment that you need for it to be any sort of serious biofuel option. So you've been looking only at open racetrack ponds, or have you been looking at photobioreactors at all? Well, so we've not said you couldn't have a photobioreactor solution. We have said it's got to be less than you know, $2 a gallon. And no one has shown us a cost model which says, with my photobioreactors at that sort of scale, I'm going to get there. And you've got these mundane issues like cleaning them. What happens if, if you need to restart the culture? What happens if you have an infection? Um, you've got kilometers. I mean, there have been some big photobioreactor demonstrations. There's one in Spain in the 90s. There's something like 500 kilometers of tubes and pipes in it. And the issue is when you try and scale up, because in this, in this version of algae anyway, you're actually using sunlight coming in in, sort of two, in, in, in a plane. Right. Yeah. When you scale up, you don't get that normal benefit of, of, of going in, in three dimensions and having larger volumes. You're still going to have all the action is happening in a sort of you know, couple of centimeter layer uh, beneath the surface there. So we just don't think that the photobioreactor concept can work, because as soon as you deploy even more capital to enclose it and pump things around, then you have, you, you have sort of punishing costs. Great, if you, if you want to grow really high-value co-products and nutraceuticals and beta-carotene and those sort of things, it can work. But for the, the ultra-low-cost commodity product that is you know, a, a fuel, we've not, seen it, we've not been convinced by anyone yet that you, you could do it that way. So we've actually sort of said we think the route is open ponds, we're open to suggestions of people, you know, and there are people growing uh, algae in, in plastic bags, and that's very low cost. And there are some sort of raceway ponds with a with a sort of uh, lid over the top. And look, fine, it, that might be the way. But I guess the fundamental thing that ties all that together is is cost uh, and stability. You know, really all year round, year in year out, to be able to produce um, high productivity algae. And you're looking at it only as uh, liquid fuels, biofuels. Well, it's interesting. I mean, this came from us looking at uh, a challenge around how you could decarbonize transport in the UK, um, and particularly aviation, where there are other options in transport like fuel cells and batteries on road transport, but there's a real problem with aviation. So that has been the focus. Um, where there are sort of energy-related co-products, then I think that's perfectly acceptable. So you know, you, you've got... Um, you know, this also produces protein and carbohydrate. If you use that carbohydrate to fuel uh, biomass CHP, then that's perfectly acceptable. But we also want to look at ways of making liquid transport fuels as well. Okay. Would, would algae be suitable as a labor-intensive process in, let's say, a developing country? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, it may be, and there's a, there's a lot of deployment of algae, not for fuels, but for other products in, in China. Um, some microalgae, so these sort of things, but also a lot of seaweed macroalgae. And in those situations, they absolutely do take advantage of, of low-cost labor. Um, and I think some of the farms in China, you know, they, they've got these pretty unsophisticated management, but literally, they have somewhere going out every morning, seven days a week, check on the strain, what needs to happen, and, and, and keep it stable. So, it does have some sort of um, low-cost labor market uh, attractiveness. 
But we think the technology to make this happen for biofuels just isn't there yet. So we're away, we're some distance from doing that. Having said that, um, one thing we've also realized is although you know, we are currently funded uh, by the UK government and we want to sort of leverage uh, a reasonably strong UK academic expertise, we think that to make something like this um, a sort of uh, commercially viable, you couldn't actually deploy in the UK for sort of fairly obvious climatic reasons. So one of the things we'll be doing next, we'll see, but one of the things we'll be doing next year is, is, is scouting for locations that have better climate for algae. And, and people have talked about North Africa, um, there's places in the Middle East, South America, and so on. So that, again, the, the climate uh, might be a part of that as well. Well, one of the things you haven't mentioned is the sort of process we go through to end up looking at certain technologies, not others. I mean, is there a slide on? Sort of three-stage process. Yeah. So let me... So um, this is kind of a prioritization framework for those large interventions. So algae is an example of that, marine and so on. And it, it's, it's about saying, you know, because we now have a reasonable knowledge base um, around low carbon technology and low carbon markets, we can actually sort of design top down what the interventions should be. And that sort of starts with a technology area prioritization. So we, we, we've looked in a pretty quantitative way at what carbon savings might be realized from deploying some potential low carbon technologies uh, at various points in the future, normally 2020, 2030, and 2050. So you get a number out of that. And then, because we're talking about a low-carbon economy and we're talking about trying to get economic value for the investment that's put into us by the UK government, we we'll also do an assessment on which of those technologies that are high-carbon saving could also deliver value to the UK. Quite often, that's around the knowledge assets that we have at the moment. Sometimes it's related to the fundamental resources. So wave and offshore wind is an economic value story for the UK because we have very good natural resources for those. That's the first stage. And we have sort of 12 technologies um, that fit in that top right-hand box there for the UK version of this chart that we're focusing on. We then sort of say, well, you know, if you believe take a technology, well, advanced biofuels are important, what are the sort of areas that are really holding that back? What, what's the best place for, the, for some, the Carbon Trust or some other uh, publicly funded body to intervene? And we'll do, we'll do an assessment um, that might come out with a conclusion that is, let's say, in, in offshore wind. Um, what you actually have a big issue with is sort of a, there are sector-wide issues around things like um, foundation energy, co foundation costs, access to the actual offshore wind turbines. And there is also a big issue around policy. The policy framework doesn't really support the deployment of it. So we'll, we'll pick a cup, two, three, four, five key barriers that look like things we could do. And we finally prioritize um, those because, as I said, we're a relatively small company. It's 150 people. And we have to focus on the things where we're going to have the most impact. And a key part of that, of, of that prioritization is the fit with the carbon trust capabilities. And also with the, and that means more broadly, if we were to assemble a team from people in the UK, you know, how competitive would that team be with um, you know, ac activities internationally? And, and actually, one of the reasons that Mark and I are here in California this week is to help us improve our understanding of what's happening in California in the US to make sure that we are you know, benchmarking uh, what we're trying to do uh, appropriately. <clears throat> Regarding offshore energy, let me ask a specific technology question. Sure. Are there any ideas of leveraging um, well, or rather co-locating wind and wave in the same structure. Are you aware of any of those? It's, be, it's been talked about. It's, yeah. Um, I, I guess um, there, were, there were major deployment challenges and operating maintenance challenges about both of those technologies. Um, I, I've yet to be convinced in anything I've seen that the actual um, the integration of those two together is, is, is actually going to simplify or indeed take costs out of the so, um, you, know, you, might, you might get certainly some cost benefit from shared installation costs, because both of them suffer from having quite a significant impact in terms of getting vessels, in, at the moment, actually getting access to the right types of vessels, because the, the sort of um, jack-up barges and the things that you need to install, certainly offshore wind turbines, are quite 
few and far between and expensive. So I can see some synergy around installation, um, operation and maintenance. I mean, I think that the, the, the major challenge here is the types of foundations you need for offshore wind turbines um, are not really particularly similar in style or structure to the types of um, situations you want for, for marine, either tidal stream or indeed wave devices. So again, in terms of the, the structural synergy there, I haven't seen anything that looks right. It doesn't, doesn't mean it can't happen, but I think, um, yeah, it's, it's it, it, either of the above are hard enough in terms of making the cost effective at the moment. And I don't think the binary, I've yet to be convinced that it can actually save on, on cost effective. Have you, have you seen anything over here? That's no, it's about? just, just an idea. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's an interesting concept, because certainly there is potential synergy around going out to maintain and so on, but I think, I mean, yeah, I, actually what's interesting is lo lots of, lots of, um, those types of devices all suffer from a problem, which is to be an attractive wave or tidal climate in particular, you, know, you are in actually pretty fast moving and difficult um, uh, offshore scenarios to, to operate in. In fact, you know, the, the weather windows you have available to actually get out there and install devices is quite, quite limited. And you've got to be really efficient and to some extent, you know, the weather dictates. I mean, I know there's been a developer that's been trying to deploy devices in the UK for some time and keeps having problems with either access to vessels because the oil and gas industry keep accessing them or weather windows, and it's, you know, it's really difficult to actually yeah. time that and get that happening. Well, we, we have seen a couple of people looking at um, utilising existing offshore structures, often oil and gas rigs, yeah. to tether, to do sort of initial deployment of, of, of their concepts, and that's both uh, WAVE. There's also a team we're working with who've got this really you know, um, interesting novel concept for a floating um, spa boy concept offshore wind um, device, and that's a smaller thing. It's sort of you know, 10 kilowatts. Um, but it's, it's actually quite nicely engineered, and, and you know, his early market will be in, in, in you know, providing additional power to um, offshore uh, oil and gas pl platforms. Well, we have seen some, on, the, on the wave topic, we have seen some really novel device concepts. One of the things we do in that um, program that Rob was talking about, which is lo looking for new device concepts. We, we've developed a methodology for screening any wave or tidal stream device we see against a common set of criteria so we can benchmark them and come out with the cost of energy. So we can look at some assumptions on the materials used, the moorings, the, the sort of the, the sizing, the, uh, how many of them we would need to generate, let's say, a 10 megawatt farm, um, the operational costs. So we come and use all that data to produce a sort of cost of energy estimate. So any, any device we see, and of course anyone who's looked at wave and type of energy knows that there's such a, an amazing range of different concepts out there. It's yeah. very difficult for investors to know which the best ones are. Which one seems to be winning? Is it the one, is it yeah. the gravitational potential which moves up and down, or are you using the momentum? of the wave to drive something? Um, I think, I, think the actual, I, don't, I don't think the winner will necessarily be a, a whole a, a category of, of energy capture like that, actually, because we, we think there's been too much focus on the energy capture approach, mm -hmm. and lots of these ways work, they all, they all do capture energy, but not on a focus on taking the cost out of that. So for us, it's more about how can you leverage that, and even, even perhaps be slightly less efficient in terms of energy capture, but do it in a fundamentally lower cost way. So I don't know if you've seen the Palamas Sea Snake uh, wave device that's been deployed in Portugal. Um, it, it's a very different, uh, the device I'm about to mention is different in, in, the, in its power takeoff approach to that, but it's actually similar in terms of it being a similar sort of length device, but it, we've actually seen this new concept come to us of making it out, out of rubber. And the way that works is it sits uh, perpendicular to the, to the incoming wave stream, and, and effectively as the wave hits a device, it causes a bulge tube in this, in this rubber device that goes through uh, to a power takeoff system and drives a turbine and so on. Uh, and because it's rubber, it's potentially much lower manufacturing cost because it's a single or a couple of joint pieces of material, a relatively low, relatively low cost material depending on the type of rubber needed. But more importantly, the, the kind of reliability and maintainability of that device is inherently better than something that's got you know, lots of mechanical um, moving parts. And, and so therefore, when we put it through our model, and again, it's still early stage high risk, but actually when you run the numbers, you say, actually, that, that could genuinely be about half the cost of other devices. So if we can make that work, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So now when we, we've had sort of since the original assessment that Rob talked about, we've seen 30 device, new device concepts recently, um, and, and we've backed two of them that we think actually could be radically cheaper. Mm -hmm. I think for us, it's, so it's more about, I mean, I, I could see some of the devices that, 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 you know, that are oscillating uh, water columns, some of them that are sort of point absorbers. I think they're, they, they all work in terms of energy capture, but it's about, can you do it cost effectively? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the real trick. As a follow-up on the previous question, um, to, to sort of delimit it, have you looked at, any other methods of companion harvesting uh, renewables? Hmm. What I'm thinking, you know, I'm just trying to move forward to like 2050 yeah. and, and looking at 
the, the previous history and where we are with, you know, coal plants that are working well are working well because they're doing yeah. cogen and, and they're employing ways to extract more energy than they can, really. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're extracting above Carnot. So they're, mm -hmm. and that happens because of, of putting apt things together in novel yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, in, in, in terms of that, um, that open call uh, area that I talked about, we've seen a couple of quite interesting heat to electrical power concepts come through recently. Uh, and some of those are using um, novel refrigerants to do very low temperature ranking cycles. And there's one really wacky one um, around ferromagnetic fluids that can exploit very low temperature differences. Um, and I think that's a key component to be able to, to, to do that and, and break through either Carnot um, or electrochemical cycle um, efficiencies. Um, so we're doing that. We're also doing all combined heat and power in, in a more conventional way. And probably it's worth mentioning in pyrolysis, um, one of the uh, teams that we're working with um, are us is using microwaves to do the, the initial pyrolysis. And, and they get, they get a, a reasonable liquid yield, but they also get a very high quality um, carbon char. Um, and that turns out to be an incredibly good fuel for coal-fired power stations. And it, you know, you're not changing the sort of energy content you're putting through, but in terms of getting that into, into the, um, the power station, and that team is actually working with the UK's largest power station. They're saying, yeah, this, is, this is the perfect biomass fuel. It's all coming from a renewable source, and it's ready to go directly. And so I think we, we've said to the teams in Paralysis, you know, you need to think about each ton of biomass that comes in and how do you use every single carbon atom in there. Uh, and that'll, be, that'll distinguish the, the people who are successful in this from those who you know, never get to market. So I think that's it. And if you want to ask any follow-up questions, I'm sure they'll stick around. Yeah. Thank nice. you so much. Thank you.